All right, here we are dealing with Divorce, Difficult Questions, Biblical Answers, Lesson 11 in the series. This one's entitled Divorce Busters, and it's part one. We're going to do two parts this, this week and next week. So uh, having taken this class, I'm sure uh, everyone is familiar with the high number of divorces that take place in America. I don't have stats for, for other countries, but certainly in America. Uh, at some point it was one out of two. As a matter of fact, the state of Oklahoma leads the nation in the divorce rate, in the high divorce uh, rate average. Of course, these um, are only percentages and figures, but these numbers really, you know, for me, came into perspective when my wife, Lise, used to tell me about the kids uh, at her school. Uh, she, uh, in the past, worked as an elementary school uh, secretary and part of her job was to monitor you know, the pickup of children at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the day by their parents or the pickup of children like when they were sick they had to leave in the middle of the day so she had a certain protocol to follow to make sure that the child was safe and released into the proper, you know, to the proper person. And I remember her explaining to me that each child had a file and in that file were the special instructions as to who was or who was not permitted to take the child home from school. And it was amazing. This file included ex-husbands, ex-wives, abusive boyfriends, angry grandparents, adoptive parents who were now separated, I mean, she had, more, she had a longer list of people who could not pick up the child than people who were allowed to pick up the child. So you know, a lot of times uh, these warring couples would bring their battles right into the school as they struggled to maintain the possession of the child. And you know, it was, not a, it was not, a pretty, not a pretty sight. You know, I wish I could say these were isolated cases, but unfortunately children in school with a mom and a dad happily working together to raise them are fast becoming the exception, not the rule. We're starting to have more single parent children than you know, two parent children. And the children who come from two parents, the original two bio parents, that family there, that family uh, is in the uh, minority. Now there's always been marital strife and divorce, it's nothing new. The big difference today is that people do not make the effort to work things out because of their children's sake, which requires you know, self-denial, requires an effort, uh, like they used to uh, many, many years ago. Our uh, weak and self-indulgent uh, generation has simply added their children to the list of casualties you know, that stem from divorce. Not, it's not a pretty sight, as I said. So it's no use going on and on about how bad divorce is or how harmful for children who are innocent victims. I think most of us are aware of this because you know, we've been affected by divorce. Either uh, you know, we've been divorced or somebody close to us has been divorced or we're in a troubled marriage, you know, so we, we get it. I, I don't have to stand here for a half hour and talk about the difficulties of, of marriage and what happens in divorce. That's what this whole class is about anyways. What I'd like to do is offer some advice on how to avoid divorce. So we've had about 10 classes about divorce, what happens, you know, guilty party, you know, innocent party, all that business. So I want to finish out the series with, you know, on a positive note, advice that comes from God's word as well as from the experience of those who have had successful marriages. So in this lesson today, my comments will be directed towards those who are not married. Like, you know, either you are unmarried at the moment or single, um, or people watching, uh, or people in your family, maybe your own children, you have unmarried children. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, aiming my remarks to these people who will eventually marry. Um, in my next lesson, I'm going to focus on those who are already married and how they can you know, help divorce-proof their uh, relationship. So next to becoming a Christian, getting married will be or is already the most significant thing that you're going to do that impacts your life. Nothing impacts your life more than, uh, getting, than getting married. 
Um, the fact that I am preaching these lessons not only says that we believe marriage is important, it also says that divorce is a very real threat. The big problem in the church, I don't mean that there's divorce in the church, that we hardly ever talk about it. You know, the fact that this course is being offered, and if you look at our history of courses being offered, even in this congregation, there haven't been a lot of courses about what to do with divorce or how to avoid, you know, we, we tend to not discuss that a lot. That's why I want to you know, do this lesson here, seven suggestions on how to prevent a divorce before you marry. Okay. Um, these ideas give, in a speech given by Dick Marcier at a divorce uh, central workshop in Amarillo, Texas a while back. So preventing a divorce. In my counseling, I, I often visit with couples who are planning to get married. And a lot of times after visiting with them and hearing their stories, my advice is don't do it. <laughs> this is a train wreck on its way to happening. You, know, you don't like to say that to people. They're in love and they think they want to get married. They've known each other and you know, been in love for all of three months. And you're saying to them, oh, you're seeing it. You know, and you're saying, oh man, this is, this is not going to work. I mean, some people just shouldn't marry each other. Some people should just wait. Most people should look carefully and deal with the signs that spell trouble before they marry. The idea is, yeah, I see all this trouble and you know, all this business and we're not getting along now, but we'll fix that once we get married. You know, that, yeah, that doesn't work like that. Life is not like that. Marriage is not like that. So based on this experience and that of other counselors, Seven suggestions for helping you avoid a divorce even before you say, I do. Suggestion number one, don't marry a non-Christian. I mean, you know, these are not going to be like breakthrough ideas. You know, if, you, if you desire a Christian home and a Christian family, don't even consider marrying someone who is not a strong Christian. You know, I've often said you, 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 you date the people you hang around with and you marry the people you date. So you know, if you're dating and hanging with uh, non-Christians, the chances are you'll probably marry a non-Christian. So the purpose of dating is to find someone who you might love and who can return that love. And the thing that young Christian people don't realize is that any number of people can fit that description. In other words, you can become involved with and love almost anyone if that's your only criterion. If my only criterion is I want to find somebody to love and who loves me. If that's the only criterion, well, any number of people can fill that, uh, that bill. The purpose of marriage, however, for a Christian is to establish a Christian home and a Christian family who will together serve the Lord and his church, that's the purpose of Christian marriage. I mean, one of the purposes. So in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, you know, Paul says that we shouldn't be bound together with unbelievers. And the primary meaning of that passage, you know, his point was that in trying to worship God properly, we should not be bound with pagans and their practices because this would not be pleasing to the Lord. That's what he's talking about in that passage. Now, in the same way, if we're trying to establish a Christian home where Christ is honored, where children are raised up in the knowledge of Christ, where the home is a tool of God to offer Christian hospitality and service, well, the only way to accomplish this is when both partners acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. It's very hard to do that when only one partner acknowledges Jesus, because you know what? That home also belongs to the other partner. And if they're not, you know, they have a say in what goes on in their home. So if they're not Christians, <laughs> they may not want to get, go along with this idea of offering the home as a place of service for the Lord. You, know, you, can, you can have a successful marriage by marrying a non-Christian. I, I wouldn't be so naive to say, oh, if, unless you marry a Christian, you can't have a successful, of course not. A lot of people have successful marriages. A lot of Christians, married to non-Christians, have a successful uh, marriage. But you won't have a Christian home. 
and the odds that your children will be strong Christians greatly diminished. Again, not impossible, but you know, you're not putting the odds in your favor. As far as divorce is concerned, when religion is a strong factor with only one of the partners, the chance of eventual divorce grows. It's just statistics, that's all, it's just statistics. So if you marry a non-Christian, realize what you're giving up. What you're giving up is not having children or being loved, that's, that's certainly possible. What you're giving up is a Christian home, a united family, and what you are putting at risk is your own relationship and your faith that will always be at odds. So that's suggestion number one. If you want to avoid divorce before you get married, don't marry someone who's not a Christian. Suggestion number two, reconsider if your parents seriously object. Of course, there are a lot of exceptions here. Lots of loopholes in this particular suggestion. You know, maybe you're on bad terms with your parents. Or maybe they have failed at marriage themselves. Or maybe they've been abusive to you in some way. You know, so there are other reasons that render their opinion invalid. But all things being equal, you know, if your parents have been the normal type of parents who have tried to love you and support you despite their own weaknesses and struggles, you should pay careful attention to their advice. You know, parents may not always know the person you bring home. You know, you, the girl says, oh, but daddy, you don't know him, or oh, mom, you don't know her. That's, that's true. But they know you. <laughs> they know their own child. And more importantly, they want what's best for you. And children do not always know what is best for them, even if they're 20 years old or 25 years old. They, you know, they haven't been around the block a lot. And the parents have. So if your parents have serious doubts and can explain them, you know, it's not enough to say, you know, your dad says, well, I just don't like him. Yeah, but why? What is it about him, dad? You don't, I don't know, I just don't like him. Well, you know, that's not enough to go on. If, if the parents can explain a little bit, you should take time to convince them of, you know, of the partner's uh, character and merit if they're, if they're mistaken. But pay attention to what they say. You know, marriages bring not only two people together, but they also bring two families together. And it's best to try to win over the family and make peace so that you can live in peace after you're married. I mean, nothing is more aggravating than having a bad relationship with your in-laws because they're part of your life. You know, if it's a battle every time you have to go over to their house or every time they come over to your house and oh, the kids and all that. I mean, that's no fun living, living like that. So before you get married, you know, keep your eyes open. Listen to your parents. All right, suggestion number three. Again, you know, we're talking about divorce proofing our marriage and suggestions before you get married. Suggestion number three. Watch how your potential mate's parents treat each other. Yeah. Watch how your potential mate's parents treat each other. You know, until we learn differently, the model for the type of husband or wife that we will be um, is our own parents. It's not impossible to change, of course, if we want to. That's what this marriage course is you know, it's all about. Learning new behavior, avoiding certain types of behavior, but until that happens, we will respond to our partner and various marital situations in much the same way our parents did. It's our first go-to position. I'm not saying we can learn new positions, you know, grow as an individual, but the natural impulse is to respond to whatever is going on in the marriage in the way that our parents did, first as a first response. Now, the sad exception is that people are usually worse than their parents and not better until they learn. You know, an example of this, you know, someone said, well, where's the biblical example? How about Isaac? How Isaac used you know, uh, Rebecca in the same way that Abraham used Sarah. Abraham offered up his wife to the king to protect himself. I mean, if, if, 
if his plan would have gone through, his wife would have been you know, one of the king's wives. And he was ready to just offer her up you know, so that you know, they wouldn't harm him. When lo and behold, you know, Isaac does the very same thing with Rebecca, one generation down when he's in trouble. So they may not act like their parents while they're dating, but chances are they will once they're married. This is why it's important to get to know and observe the behavior of your partner's parents so that you can discuss this with them and make the changes needed before you commit. Before there's you know, little desire to change. Before the, you know, the divorce is the solution. You know, if, you're, if, if, if the young woman, you know, fiance has a, you know, a, a father who's got a bad temper, or solves everything with anger and shouting, that may be the go-to position for the son. Be a good thing you know, to talk about that. You know, drill down on that a little bit. Just some signs that you see. These are just like warning signs. Suggestion number four, do not marry someone who abuses drugs. You know, I include alcohol and all recreational drugs in this category. Alcohol and drug abuse are responsible for half the divorces today, half. People who drink, even social drinkers, or do dope once in a while before they marry, usually continue to do so after they marry. Marriage by itself does not cure drug and alcohol dependency. <laughs> for women or for men. I mean, we've seen it even in this congregation, people I've worked with. Young girl who's taking drugs when she's 15, gets married at 21, has a child thinking, you know, the husband thinking, well, you know, she's all grown up now, that's just a childish thing, grew out of it, you know, no. <laughs> still abusing and still using after the first child, after the second child, you know. It's a way of life for some people. So the Bible says that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, Galatians 5, uh, 21. Just show you that scripture there. And neither will those who abuse any other form of drugs or any type of abuse, if you wish, pornography. You know, don't, you know, I, I could have said, don't marry someone who abuses drugs. I could have said, don't marry someone who abuses and then just put the line, you know, an empty line, you fill it in. Food, porn, whatever. I tell young people, if you want your life to center on helping another person get off of drugs as a lifetime chore, then marry someone who abuses something because your divorce is in the bag. Even if you love this person, is this the life you really want for yourself and your children? Can you have a marriage when this is present? Sure. Can you have a very happy one? Well, that's less sure. Suggestion number five. Find out if your potential mate can manage money. <laughs> We're stepping on all the toes this morning. <laughs> when you are dating, the key thing is spending money on gifts and outings. That's not a way to measure if your potential partner is good with money, if they buy you stuff and treat you or take you out. That's fun. You know, we judge our partner's enthusiasm based on his or her spending ability on us. Well, that's, that's not how you judge their money management style. <laughs> Marriage is more concerned with saving and managing money than spending it. How good is she or he on this? In marriage courses, counselors tell us that in the first six months of marriage, the number one cause of arguments is not sex, it's money. So your potential partner's attitude about money, in other words, who controls the money, and how should it be spent, and how important it is, or uh, how it is shared, will determine not only your lifestyle, but also the number of conflicts that you're going to have. Why? Well, because everything costs money. 
<laughs> everything costs money. The food you eat costs money. The transport, you know, everything is, is somehow touched by money. So there's a lot of reason and a lot of potential for conflict. So how your partner managed the money to buy what you will need will be the subject of a lot of discussions. So make sure that your partner not only knows how to make and spend money, but also knows how to manage and share money as well. You know, you know, sometimes we're looking at our partner, looking at their earning potential. Wow, you know, my future husband's got a lot of earning potential, and that's great. But how is he at managing the money he earns? You know, it's, it's as difficult to live with a, with a cheapskate as it is putting up with a, a squanderer. You know, both, both things cause grief. Suggestion number six, don't marry a liar. You think that that would be, you know, <laughs> I mean, nobody's perfect, that's true, and sometimes we fall victim to lies. It happens to everybody. However, some people use lying as a coping device, as a way to get what they want as a method of self-preservation or ego building. You know, marriage is based on trust. It is the single most important element within the marriage bond. The hardest thing to build, the easiest thing to lose. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. If, if, if your potential partner can't tell the truth on a little thing, how, how are you going to trust them to tell the truth on you know, stuff that's important or painful? The Lord wasn't only referring to the ability to be responsible here, He also includes the ability to be faithful or true in one's handling of matters dealing with honesty and integrity. I mean, if he continually breaks his word over small things, you know, your partner, or if she never follows through exactly on what she says, well, this person has trouble with the truth. A good marriage cannot be built unless there is a willingness to tell the complete truth at all times. Unless there is a trust that the other person's word is solid, you'll always be in doubt. What a terrible way to have a marriage. Not being able to believe anything your partner says, big or small. So if you can't have complete confidence in the other person, and here's the point, enough to put your very life into their hands, don't, don't do it, or don't do it now, meaning don't get married or wait. Unfortunately, what young couples are more concerned about when they're getting married is the, the party. I call it the party. You know, what am I going to wear? And who's going to do my hair? And did you rent the tuxedos? And you know, where, you know, the menu, all the energy that goes into that party. And that's, of course, sure, it's great. It's, it's a lifetime thing. You're only supposed to be doing it just one time. You know, I'm not putting down having a great wedding. It's, it's marvelous. It's wonderful. Yes. But so many couples don't invest as much energy or time into knowing the person that they're going to get married to. And then they wonder why they're having problems afterward. I repeat, if, if you cannot put your life into the hands of your partner and do so confidently, you know, wait a while. There's something missing. There's a piece of information you don't know yet. And then, you know, always when you get to the very last one, somebody's thinking, oh boy, the last one's going to be you know, knocking it out of the park, a thing I never thought of. And here it is. Can they hold down a job? <laughs> I mean, Sounds old fashioned, doesn't it? 
But it's a long and miserable life in a marriage with a man, for example, if he's the primary earner, who doesn't like to work. A person who can't hold on to a job. A person who won't take orders from anybody. Or a person who refuses to improve their skills. It's so very difficult to live with a woman, for example, who wants to get married only so she can quit her job. Or only because you know, she wants to get out of her parents' house. Last I, last I knew, getting out of my parents' house was not a, a viable reason to get married. It wasn't one of the biggies. Now the Bible, you know, it doesn't say anything about women working outside the home. It's it's silent on that, no opinion on it. Probably because, but one of the reasons is because at the time, uh, in that society, when the Bible was written, very few women worked outside the home. So there was no need to comment on it. But it does say something about women and work. Paul says that women should be workers at home. Titus 2 verse 5 talks about women to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind and subject to their own husbands, so on and so forth. The idea was that they were not just at home, but they were keepers of the home. That's the job. So the modern day application is that whether a woman works outside the home or is at home exclusively, she is bound by the same rule of good stewardship as men in the workplace and the responsibility of being the, quote, keeper or manager of the household. The Bible gives her that role. So going out to work doesn't absolve her of this responsibility. It means that the couple has to be more creative and cooperative in fulfilling the needs of the home. So if your prospective partner likes to sleep too much, or play too much, or hates their job, or hates work in general, Prepare to be poor. Prepare to carry the load by yourself. Prepare to spend a lot of time regretting the day you said, you know, I do. So I'm sure in many of the married couples and those who have married off children, you know, here, watching this here, you could add more suggestions. You know, I put seven. You know. There are more suggestions. You know. Don't marry on the rebound. That's a good suggestion. Don't marry someone you don't like. You know what we're talking about, right? I love him, but I can't, I hate him, you know? I love her, I can't live without her, it's magic, it's electricity, you know? But I don't, I don't actually, we don't actually have fun together. You know, people have that relationship. They're drawn physically, sexually, but aside from that, they don't have fun with one another. How many movies have been made on that premise? Right? The, the guy and the girl and then the third party. The one that sh she needs to be with over here. You know. But that movie touches us because it's, it happens in life. Don't marry somebody you don't like. Don't marry a non-communicator. Ah, he's the strong and silent type. He doesn't say anything. It's so, I'm just so, it's so wonderful. There must be so much depth there. There must be so much hiding, just waiting to come out. And when we marry, I'm sure I'll be dry, able to draw all of this out of him. Nope. <laughs> He's still silent 26 years later. <laughs> and she's still talking to herself. I mean, you know, if you're a talker and you're a communicator, be very careful. Don't marry a flirt. You know, if there's another woman around, he has to make sure that she notices him. Whether it's a server at the restaurant or the hostess at the hotel, you know, if there's another woman around, he has to find a way, he or she, you know, has to find a way to get into that person's orbit. Why? Well, shut that Shut that down, because that's the way the person is. Somehow that's the way they get their ego fed. Yeah, it's a long life. The, the point of this is my husband is that 
The key word there, my. <laughs> this is mine, nobody else's. I tell couples who are already married, you know, maybe having some issues uh, uh, about intimacy, sexual intimacy, you know, well, it's not like it used to be, blah, blah, blah. What do I do? You know, do, do I buy lingerie? Do we do you know, get a getaway? You know, I, and usually my first piece of advice is, uh, the first thing to look at, see if you can um, increase your faithfulness. And, and they look at me, what? See if you can increase your faithfulness. See if you can demonstrate to your partner a greater level of faithfulness, loyalty, commitment to them and to them alone. That your best words are only for them, your compliments are only for them, your, your, your loveliest clothing only for them, your looks, the look of, of, of enjoyment, passion, appreciation, your best looks are only for them. Try that first because usually that's the thing that is wearing down the relationship. Uh, don't marry a person with a bad temper. We've talked about that, because that's the way they are. Personally, I believe all the suggestions to avoid divorce before you marry can be summarized into one single positive sentence. Marry somebody who loves Jesus. If the person you marry loves the Lord, then they will love and obey His word, they will serve His church, they will know how to love you with Christ's love, and they will know how to love your children with Christ's love, and they will never leave you for any reason. If they love the Lord, these things are standard equipment. It comes with the package. It doesn't have to be negotiated. It's, it, it's just part of the package. No marriage with Jesus Christ truly as the Lord of both partner has ended in divorce. It's ended through death or separation, but people who are committed to the Lord both equally and to one another, boy, that's the strongest defense against divorce. Okay, so next week we're going to continue this lesson as we examine some of the things that will keep those who are already married married. That's why we call it divorce busters. All right, so we'll do that next week. In the meantime, I encourage all those who are not getting married to commit their futures to Jesus Christ and search for mates who want to go to heaven as badly as you do. If you marry that guy or that girl, chances are you're going to have a great success. All right, that's our class for this morning. Thank you very much.